Case Peter, it's you. We've got 20 minutes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very kind introduction and the, the onset of my presentation, which is not going to be dealing with past, as a matter of fact. So this is probably one of the first points where we're going to do a sharp turnaround, that 180 degree or even maybe 360 or twice 180 degree turn, because we're going to talk about something that didn't yet happen. And we're going to talk about the future. and. Um, a little bit of introduction about myself. I'm actually a native Pole. Um, I came to the United States the first time in 1994 as an exchange international student. Um, and I, it was intended that I'm going to be here only one year, but then events unfolded, and here I am, 2019. And we're merging that with the 80th anniversary of the celebrations of the outbreak of the Second World War, which is really amazing. <clears throat> the one thing that I would like to mention, I would like to excuse two of my speakers, Dr. Belchukov and Dr. Fox, that as a matter of fact wrote a pretty famous book on the application of the Rush model, which is really a psychometric model intended to measure specifically perceptions, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, images of participants. It doesn't really matter in what field, but it's very applicable topic to be discussed, especially in the light of all of the events and these misrepresentations that we were just presented that are either a result of a deliberate ma manipulation, so they're implicit in nature, or sometimes explicit, because simply they're a carryover of certain propaganda mechanisms that are perpetuated by the general public, uh, simply as a you know unconscious slip, a Freudian slip or something like that. But I have to mention that uh, a lot of Americans, uh, friends, for example, I used to work for a Fortune 500 company before when April 10, 2010 happened. And we know what happened back then. Is, does anybody know? April 10, 2000, what happened? <laughs> Smolensk. And the famous crash in Smolensk in the celebration of the Katyn massacre. You know, a lot of Americans' friends actually came up to me. And that was in a business context. and actually express their sympathies, you know, relating to these unfortunate events that took place that we're still trying to recover. But anyhow, it's a very complicated topic. It has to do something with the measurement of perceptions, which is what we very much care about, especially in the era where we get so many conflicting pieces of information coming from all sides. And it is ironic to me that even simple and straightforward events that should be uh, demonstrably, you know, interpreted one way or another, you kind of get the two opposite extremes, and then you end up somewhere in the average. It's kind of a comparison that I've heard that you keep one leg in heat or in fire, the other one in ice, and the average is comfortable, but that's not the position that we want to be, <laughs> and we really want to untangle what the truth is. So for that, we have a systematic approach, which is called the Rush approach, that is used in survey research. And as a matter of fact, when we're toying with the idea how we're going to wrap around it in a relationship to studying the perceptions of Poland, knowledge, images, attitudes, beliefs, or what have you, among the various demographic segments in the United States, because that would be the intention to capture it as such, you know, um, I figured, well, we do need a systematic approach, and we have to go beyond analysis of individual items. In other words, it's not as simple as how many people know about this and that, number one. How many people know about this and that, number two. What we really have to think about is the general concept and how all of these items contribute to the overall measure of what we call, hence we need a measurement model, which is the Rush model. But I probably spent too much time on the introduction. The one shocking, or not shocking, but surprising factor will be that some of the examples that I use are specifically coming from a large-scale deployment of a perception study that was conducted by the National Institute or Center for the Studies on European Union in conjunction with the London School of Economics and University of Canterbury, New Zealand. And as a matter of fact, I was one of the participants of that project. <laughs> and it dates back to 2010, and it involved 10,000 participants where we're trying to capture these perceptions 
in 10 different countries in Asia Pacific, Thailand, China, and so forth, and so on, India, of what they think, what the image is. And when I discussed it with Marek Boger, uh, we saw an immediate application because he actually read my dissertation. <laughs> I used their data, the 10,000 participants, of how we can use in the study of external perceptions in the US. External because the actor is not, the poll is not, even though I've been exposed to a lot of factual information here that I wasn't aware of, even growing up in the culture. You know, so hence it's not internal, it's external perceptions what the outside public thinks. And of course, they're not gonna read Norman Davis' book. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not gonna be testing them on the knowledge of Norman Davis, but what we want to do is to present some images and let the participants rate them. And I will illustrate that with adequate examples a little bit later. So let's move on to slide number two. There is only 30 slides, so we'll have to skip some of them <laughs> naturally. <laughs> but, um, well, some of the background, I already mentioned that European study, but my uh, co-authors that unfortunately had a medical reason, and it turned out that both of them actually had the same reason, and here I am, and the burden of proof is on my shoulders, but they also participated in extensive external perceptions of NATO, and they also were involved in a project on, um, on Boeing, that was when the Dreamliner was coming out and they had a lot of passenger data and they were asked to rate their experience with the flight experience with that particular uh, aircraft. And I spent four years also in the Gulf of Mississippi uh, where we're doing coastal residence evaluations in eve of preparation of natural disasters. Um, so Katrina, for example, 2010 event, and then 2015 BP oil spills, very interested in perceptions. So again, it's not a historical, it's about thinking about the future, but using these examples from these studies and how potentially we can use them effectively to capture constructs, and entire constructs. Let's move on. Okay, something about the develop. I'm not going to bore you with the develop development of these psychometric models that are used to capture these various aspects of knowledge, beliefs, systems, and so forth and so on, but there was a progression that started in 1950, actually originally with George Rush in Denmark, who was a mathematician who gave a number of series of lectures at the University of Chicago. These lectures were too complicated for psychometricians and too easy for mathematics but one person that actually attended all the lectures and f found an adequate venue in terms of the applications and became the proponent of these measures was Benjamin Wright, uh, which is the gentleman actually to the right. And then we have Mike Lineker that wrote some of the programs that we use in capturing these perceptions. That is assuming that we already have the relevant data that we captured with the various instruments. But the model is very useful in terms of designing instrument that we call would be reliable and valid for its applications kind of consistent with educational testing services and the Samuel Massick's definition of what a valid finding is, because it's one thing to present a finding, another thing, what is the source of the finding and how it unfolded. <clears throat> so basically, if we come back to the previous slide, uh, we have an observation to the left, which is probed on a progression from less to more, and it could be actually yes or no. Are you familiar with Auschwitz? Are you familiar with Treblinka, with Majdanek? with Monte Cassino, with cruising line, and so forth and so on. It's yes and no. Or we could be probing an attitude, you know, uh, Poland's image is vulnerable. On a scale from, Likert scale, from strongly disagree, strongly agree, with five response options that assume progression, we gauge the participants, uh, now, or actually level of attitude. And the question is, we need that black box paradigm that is going to translate all of that and give us a more physical, like what we see with distance or temperature, gauge, if you will, of that disposition that we're attempting to measure that is based on abstract ideas, but we're using items actually to capture what it is. So we move on. We're trying to go beyond statistical patterns. We're trying to go beyond simply some score or average, which are commonly reported. As a matter of fact, when I was doing a review of the existing perceptions of Poland, they were very fragmented, very isolated, and, and frankly speaking, not adequate in terms of what we think a psychometric approach. And they were based on individual items that simply reference so many participants said this and so many participants said that on another item, well, so many participants disagreed with that. 
But that's not meaningful. How do I extract an overall measure? And, and it is argued within rush measurement that we actually have to go beyond the simple totals because items are not equivalent. Asking somebody about Majdanek is not the same as Auschwitz. Asking about Cruzen line is not the same like Westerplatte and so forth and so on. Items don't contribute equally to that final score, and this is one of the properties that we're trying to utilize. Moving on. Okay, so it is about construction of a construct. These are some possibilities. As I said, we're not going to be talking about the past. We're going to be talking about the future. And these are some possibilities of some questions that could be answered in a more objective, systematic way using survey research as the methodological tool and then using a rush measurement model in terms of designing a potential instrument, testing it, piloting them, then implementing it, and then gathering the data and aggregating the data into a possible measure that is a linear, what we call equal interval. We have that ruler that we can gauge what the disposition, what the knowledge of Poland actually is on a particular issue, or generally, if we wish so. <clears throat> so you see, a simple example would be the knowledge, and then we can progress into the attitude, into the perception, misperception, mis classification of certain ideas. And then potentially, once we have a viable measure of that particular disposition, how it manifests itself across various demographic information, such as gender, such as political affiliation, such as you know, whether or not you voted in the last parliamentary elections, and so forth and so on. And here, we would have to put our brains together which items would be relevant for that, because college student is going to be different than you know, um, just general, you know, participant or, or maybe a academician or something like that. They're going to have different dispositions, but what we're trying to capture is the general public. The only one thing that we have to worry about with the demographics is that it's not always a very segmented, you know, um, not very straightforward because there are many things that contribute to a score. So how do you know it is being a female or being educated or having a particular experience or being Polish American or Italian. I mean, all of these factors interact together. We have to be very careful how we structure them in discerning the meaning. <clears throat> Moving on, some other research questions that could be answered that would be very nice if we had such an approach in place. Moving on. And of course, we're using survey research. We use the TNS um, global um, research firm actually based out of London when we did the EU perception study. Um, and there are a number of organizations and a number of tools that we can use for deployment. In our situation, it was deployed through email, but I was involved also in research projects where we went in Mississippi, for example, on the coastal communities, Biloxi, Gulfport. We actually used a GIS software. We identified the households and we knocked on people's doors. <laughs> And of course, you not always get the participant that you want, but then you knock on the neighbors, which is really very similar participant in comparison to the one that you intended. <laughs> and we did it as a guided interview that took about 30 minutes. So it could be potentially you know, done like that if we isolate a specific segment in Midwest, Midwest cities, Toledo, Cleveland, you know, um, uh, Columbus, and so forth and so on. We could actually go with GIS software, identify specific households and knock on people's doors <laughs> and that's how it's accomplished. Sometimes it's pleasant experience, sometimes not because people don't want to be bothered on Saturday afternoon. But once you present what the objective is, they're very eager and very willing to engage actually in the discussion. I ended up in households where I ended up staying like 40 minutes and discussing with people about Katrina and so on. So, so it doesn't have to go bad in other words. Okay, let's move on. Okay, all of the things about that can go on wrong with survey research, the rush model and the methodology sometimes will resolve it, sometimes it will not resolve it. There are many errors, so whenever they give you, oh, this is the result, but we really have to look deeper what happened in the process. And it's not necessarily about the analysis, it's really about the process from A to Z, from the get-go, alpha to omega, you know, what happened in between. Sampling frame, which is coverage error, is the most common one, for example. That's when there is a misrepresentation between the intended audience, who I wanted to capture, and who I ended up in the pool. Uh, so for example, I wanted to knock on that door, but I ended up the neighbor. Well, it's probably not a big coverage error, but there are some gross misclassifications. I can think about a study that was done in New York, in a part of Alhambra, I think it was um, uh, Los Angeles, and they wanted general public's perceptions of something. It was health issues, 
and they ended up with a lot of Chinese that couldn't answer the survey in English. So in the end, they didn't get the participants they intended. There was a coverage error, but they reported the results. So whenever we cite something in terms of results, we really have to look at these issues because they will occur. <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, this is an example of that because we're running out of time. I would need three semesters to really <laughs> cover all of the issues you know, that can go wrong and how to remedy them possibly. But this is the European Union study, 10,000 over participants, really expensive. I'm glad that I didn't <laughs> have to <laughs> pay it out of my pocket as I'm having even trouble covering the parking <laughs> expense at the Marriott Hotel. But anyhow, various facets, constructs that we're trying to address. One of them was knowledge of the European Union and how we did it. We specifically asked them about, it's again, not gonna be the Norman Davis book. It's gonna be specific examples that average citizen in India, Thailand, China, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, and all of the countries can relate to. And then we want to see, we're just asking them yes and no. So there is no progression. There is simply probing. You either know it or you don't know. You've heard about the organization you didn't hear. So let's see what happened. Okay, we'll skip the statistics. Skip the statistics. Okay, the one before. No, one after. This one. Okay, what we have here is what the Rush model folks at the University of Chicago, actually it's a series of different models and we happen to be using just one or two of them. And then now it evolved into something which is called item response theory, which is really the extension of the Rush models. But we have that linear progression of knowledge from less to more, which is built like a ruler. That's after the black box paradox, we transformed these ordinal responses, yes and no, binary in nature into from red or white or black and white into a linear measure of knowledge that we can say Joe is higher than Susan and by that much because it's an equal interval measure. So the transformation took place and this is the basically where they belong on that knowledge scale and we can see that the one that people are the most familiar one is the UN, United Nations. And then at the very top, is the one that is very unknown. It's very difficult, this is why, this is why it's very high. It, people are not familiar with it. It's the European Court of Justice. And we know exactly by how much it is different, not based on the total score, but based on the transform rush score. Likewise, I was thinking and listening to all of the presentations that you guys, ooh, it was so overwhelming over the course of the two days. Items about knowledge of Poland that we can probe the participants on. So we have Auschwitz-Birkenau, everybody has heard, so it's gonna be at the bottom of the continuum. And then we progress, maybe Polish pilots, people have heard, ghetto uprising, Monte Cassino, Ribbentrop, Molotov, maybe so. And then at the very top, we have Majdanek, Treblinka, maybe the home army, Westerplatte, that participants are not so familiar with. So these are the areas that we have to address. Well, what to do with the findings is yet another thing. First, we have to expose in a linear fashion what they are, and that's what the model is about. Moving on to a second example, if we go before, before that, before that. Okay, this is descriptive images of the European Union as seen in the 10 countries, okay? And I guess we have strong, likable, fair, aggressive, peaceful, modern, hypocritical, efficient, and so forth and so on. Now probed on a continuum, so it's not yes and no, it's a progression that stretches from not yes quite well, I identify it with, with, with up to, no, I don't identify with that particular image. Let's see what happened in the Rush model with it. One second one. This is the disposition of how the participants actually see European Union. At the bottom, modern, which is the most frequently endorsed. That's what they see European Union to be. We would like to see Poland as modern too. <laughs> and then at the very top, aggressive, they don't see it as an aggressive actor, the whole European Union. And then I was thinking about the adjectives that we can use in terms of Poland and Polish events and Polish history, that it was so painful, unrealistic, heroic, defenseless, weak, not ready, isolated, cooperative, betrayed by allies, awaiting help. And people can think about these dimensions. They can relate to them. It's not testing them on Norman Davis, okay, on particular events, particular date, but you know, what is the image that you have about Poland's role in the Second World War? Was it betrayed? Was it awful? Was it strong? Was it uh, heroic and so forth and so on. We can think about the different adjectives and if we we're going to you know, design perhaps an instrument like that, that would be 
you know, I would solicit your help naturally in terms of, you know, how we want to structure that. But then we could see how these items spread out on that continuum. And then maybe one more slide because we're going to be running out of time. We'll move beyond that. We can see how the trends, how does that knowledge or the disposition or the perception or the attitude manifest itself across the various socio demographic groups. And here we have the particular countries and we can see where the differences are. China is really different than Australia, which is the dip in there in terms of perception of the European Union in terms of you know, how aggressive it is or how modern it is. We could build similar images, but based on objective model that has been well articulated and used in educational testing, for example, because the Rush model is one of the main models that is used to determine who is better, which school district is better, and in ETS, it's used in many applications, standardized testing, but also in psychometrics. I'm currently working on one project where we look at the efficacy of treatments of patients with the use of technologies, uh, video conferencing and so forth versus traditional, and we do a meta-analysis, something more complicated, but ba basically the bread and butter of it, it is that rush model that I wanted to present because we can extract more objective linear measures of these dispositions which go beyond the descriptive, you know, knowledge or the descriptive properties of the single items. So you're higher on this, I am lower on this, and you're a little bit average on that, and, and in the end we don't know anything. We need one unified concept that binds all of the items together, and these items would be the ones that will appear on these survey instruments. So that's all in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Popczewski.